Good. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, let me just uh, share my uh, screen. Got it. I think that's the right one. Do you see my uh, title slide? You're good. Good. Thanks. So thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. It's my pleasure and uh, an honor for me to uh, report uh, on behalf of the, the work that was done by the, uh, the expert working group uh, to uh, on, on uh, uh, or mandate or convened by, by DFC. So, um, just uh, okay, there you go. So, uh, as uh, Stephen uh, just uh, alluded to uh, about a year ago or in early 2021, there was a uh, media attention that was uh, that was drawn to uh, uh, butter consistency and a potential association with cows feeding uh, being fed palm oil, and I've I've put that in uh, in, in bracket uh, on purpose, and that that was part of the clarification or the the the, the, the neb nebulous part that we wanted to to clarify as well. There was even. Uh, uh, hashtag and uh, uh, name that was uh, attributed to that uh, that controversy called the the, the Buttergate. So, following that, uh, and and there was a lot of uh, of uh, allegations and uh, uh, suppositions. So, uh, DFC wanted to convene a working group to uh, to review the available scientific literature or data that we could find to uh, confirm or not any changes in butter consistency that would have been uh, observed over time, and also factors that, that would affect it, uh, in, including the use of palm-derived uh, palm uh, feed supplements, uh, potentially identify gaps in knowledge that, that would prevent us from, uh, from understanding the situation, as well as assess the safety and environmental impacts, because those were also two areas that were uh, raised in the in the the, the the wake of the controversy on uh, safety of dairy products for consumers and uh, potential impacts that sort are associated with uh, the use of palm uh, palm products. So that's what uh, the the working group did for for uh, for a large part. They uh, each in their in their own uh, area of specialization, they uh, pr proceeded to review the literature literature and and the data that's available. But also, in addition to the the, the literature review, we also commissioned or or, or uh, initiated two data collection efforts that were specific for this uh, this task force. First is. Uh, uh, a compilation of the raw milk fatty acid profile from across Canada. So we know we knew that uh, both for uh, Ontario and Quebec, we had uh, significant information uh, going back for a couple of years uh, on on a fatty acid profile of raw milk from the payment sample. So uh, that that's where we asked uh, uh, Dave, Dave, and uh, and Karen to to compile this data and also extend it to the rest of the country by uh, uh, time specific uh, collection of of samples. So Dave will report on that a little later. And we also wanted to. Uh, go out in the in the field and in stores and collect some butter samples and try to have a, a lay a bit of a lay of the land of in terms of what do we see in terms of butter characteristics both in terms of fatty acid profile and some of the the uh, uh, rheological properties. So just uh, uh, just uh, logistically, we held six. I think it's actually seven meetings uh, throughout the the spring and the, the summer. Mostly, fall was mostly on on writing and then editing the report. Uh, but not only uh, work did we work uh, amongst ourselves at the, at the expert uh, group, but we also invited expert uh, from external experts to uh, report on various areas. So uh, one was uh, the uh, general manager at uh, Animal. Nutrition of Canada, Melissa Dumont, uh, to have an idea of the, the the on the feed side in terms of the supplies and and how to try to get any information that would be available in terms of amounts that would have that that the, of uh, the the palm products that would have been imported or fed or used across Canada. Uh, we also came, became aware that there was a similar uh, data collection effort uh, that was uh, to, to the one that I just referred to uh, on uh, on retail butter that had been undertaken uh, by a, a, co a colleague of yours at the University of Guelph, Dr. Marangoni. So we uh, invited uh, Dr. Marangoni to come in and present uh, uh, some of the data that he had uh, already collected. We also wanted to have a good understanding and, and uh, report on the uh, for the safety part uh, the from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, what are the, uh, the the approval or the regulatory 
uh, aspects around the use of, uh, of, uh, of those uh, feed supplements. And, and outside of the meetings, we also had discussions with, with external members, whether it's OMAFRA, but also internationally with uh, Fonterra in, uh, in uh, New Zealand, uh, NMPF in the US, and uh, Friesland Campina in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands, where there had been um, issues or, 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 or uh, uh, situ situations in the past that they had to handle that were similar. So we wanted to get a bit of their experience uh, of what, they, what, what had come out of that. Uh, just briefly, the, the composition of the, the working group. So I had the, the, the pleasure and the privilege to be to, to chair this group, but uh, there was a, a lot of expertise from various areas. So doctors uh, uh, Hanley and Bazinet from University of Toronto uh, are experts in, in uh, human health uh, related to uh, fatty acid nutrition uh, and, and dairy products. So they they had they they had uh, they brought in that expertise around the around the table. Uh, Dave was also a significant contributor in terms of the animal health, but also analyzing the uh, fatty acid profile data. Uh, Dr. Rachel Gervais from uh, Université Laval, who has expertise in animal nutrition, milk composition, but also uh, did the butter testing, both uh, uh, chemically and, uh, and the uh, rheological properties. Dr. Yves Pouliot, also from University of Laval, who's a food scientist uh, and has expertise on the processing uh, aspects related to uh, butter and butter uh, properties. Jean-François Mena from uh, CIREG, who is, uh, which is a, a research unit at University of Montreal on uh, sustainability and more specifically on life cycle analysis uh, expertise to comment and, and gather uh, information about the sustainability and environmental impacts of, uh, of uh, palm oil. And we have uh, Elaine Scott uh, from the, as a representative of the Consumers Association, Consumers Association of Canada uh, to, to have a, 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 an insight and, and a, a, have an observer from the consumer side. And uh, we also had industry experts uh, from from uh, various uh, segments of the industry. So Mathieu Frigon, who's uh, from Deepak, the processing uh, sector. So we have uh, we had uh, an insight and, and information from the processing side. Ed Friesen, who is uh, the the observer from uh, the, the the Dairy Farmers of Canada board, and uh, provincial uh, from provincial organizations. Bita from Ontario, uh, Woody who used to be at uh, BC, and Chantal from from the Quebec uh, Milk Marketing Board, and support from uh, DFC staff. So, uh, so that that's the uh, the logistics uh, part and the, the, the membership of the committee. Uh, great committee to work with. Very professional. They're very engaged in the process, and so all of them pr provided significant contribution, which which you can uh, see in the report. Uh, the extensive and uh, the extensive uh, review and, and knowledge uh, accumulation and, and review in the the report is the is from uh, the the work of uh, of this group. So uh, the first chapter that I wanted to just touch base on, because all, most, most of you are uh, involved and have a good knowledge of the dairy industry, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but uh, we thought it was uh, important to uh, step back a bit and, and, and bring some, some basic understanding of cow nutrition because of, for the audience that, uh, that, that would be uh, reading this report uh, to, to provide a bit of context uh, around what's the reality of feeding a cow and why would we be feeling, feeding uh, palm oil. Uh, so, so obviously that's not a very uh, highly scientific chapter, but uh, that that was one of the the the, the uh, 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 observation that we had that there was a lot of this discussion around this controversy, uh, with people not understanding what what's happening and and, and uh, assuming uh, uh, things that that were not right. So, uh, the the first thing was to review the, the milk fat synthesis and the milk milk fatty acid profile and the origin of milk uh, fatty acids in uh, in, in milk. Uh, being uh, and emphasizing that that milk fat is is a very complex uh, lipid uh, uh, matrix, uh, one of the most complex in, in nature, uh, and and part of it comes from how it it comes about. Uh, there's the, the fatty acids that that make up the the milk fat come from uh, different sources. They can be made by the mammary gland, so the, the novel fatty acid from from precursors from uh, rumen fermentation. Uh, they can be uh, preformed from uh, so absorbed, taken up from the circulation, and and that again can come from either uh, uh, fatty acids that are, that are dietary fatty acids that are absorbed 
from the from the diet components or uh, mobilized from in in the periods of uh, negative energy balance and more specifically related to uh, this controversy with uh, the, the issue around palmitic acid. Uh, palmitic acid is particular in the fact that it's of mixed origin. Some of it comes from the novo synthesis in the mammary gland, and some of it is uh, taken up preformed from the, the circulation. Uh, and and just, just uh, around the area of palmitic acid, the, just the name itself uh, also, I think, contributed to the, uh, the, the, the nature of the controversy, because it's easy to associate that because there's palmitic acid in milk, uh, it has to come from palm oil. Uh, whereas it's important to 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 uh, reemphasize that C16 or palmitic acid is naturally the predominant uh, fatty acid in milk, uh, regardless of what you feed the, the cow, and even if there's no uh, palm uh, palm products in the in the ration. So that that was important to to, to clarify. Uh, and then uh, the, the discussion about the uh, the energy requirements or energy sources for a cow and the, 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 the question of the energy balance and the importance of energy balance to a cow uh, and, and emphasizing also geographic differences in, in feeding system and feeds that are available to uh, to meet those energy requirements and the rationale for lipid supplementation. So uh, lipids have a place in dairy cows ration because of their energy density to uh, to help meet the high energy requirements of cows. Uh, and, and more specifically, uh, palm derived fatty acids, because of their content of saturated for of the saturated fatty acids, have a desirable uh, or have desirable characteristics or, or, or properties for uh, feeding uh, dairy cows as opposed to uh, unsaturated fatty acids, uh, which uh, the rumen has a limited ability to, uh, to handle. Uh, related to that, we also were able to get some estimates of uh, how much palm uh, derived uh, feed supplements were imported in Canada. And that number is about around 35,000 tons a year. That sounds like a lot of, of, uh, of products. So on, on the one side, that, that's, that's a very small proportion of all the palm oil production in the world. That's less than, than a tenth of a, a hundredth of a percent. Uh, but also if you do a back of the back of a, or the table uh, calculation, uh, if you assume about a million cows uh, in Canada uh, and uh, there's uh, the feeding rate of about 300 uh, grams per day or a little more. So that, that would be about a third of the cows that would be, that would be feed uh, be fed uh, some form of palm uh, derived uh, product. Uh, we also have a bit of the uh, an outline of the the, the regulations around the, these products uh, and and the extent or or what is considered when uh, the CFIE is looking for approval for these products. So looking at uh, animal and human safety, safety for the environment uh, in, in Canada or in, in, in the, the, the area of use, and also effectiveness. So the, the, does, does the product do what it's supposed to, to be doing in terms of efficacy and effectiveness? Uh, the next couple of slides, I'll just highlight some of the, 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 the findings in uh, chapter, I think it's, I believe it's chapter three uh, in, the, in the report or chapter two, maybe on, uh, no, chapter three on uh, fa fa different factors are affected by fatty acid profile. And that chapter was largely written by uh, Rachel Gervais from uh, Laval University. So uh, I think that that was important to, to highlight that uh, Feed the, the, the use of lipid supplements in the ration is, is one of uh, many factors that can affect fatty acid profile in milk and more specifically uh, palmitic acid content in milk. Many of those factors are related to, uh, to nutrition. So the fiber content of, of, the, of the ration, uh, especially in regards to the, the de novo fatty acids that are providing precursors to, uh, to the synthesis of uh, fatty acids in the mammary gland, but also dietary uh, unsaturated fatty acids, both providing a, 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 a source of, of absorbed uh, uh, fatty acids that can be taken up by the mammary gland, but also the, uh, the, the, the impact or the limited tolerance of, uh, of two unsaturated fatty acids by rumen microbes and the change that, that can, can impact uh, that, that, uh, to, to the milk, to milk fat production. Fat supplements obviously can, can have an impact both in terms of, of how much you, they're, they're used, but also their own fatty acid profile. And more and more we're seeing 
understanding the impact of feeding behavior. So uh, cr uh, crowding and overcrowding and uh, uh, bunk space are factors that impact feeding behavior and meal size and, and chewing uh, uh, and rumination. And that in turn has an impact on, uh, on fatty acid profile so, and free, as well as feed strategies and the use of uh, ionophores. On the non-nutritional aspect, there's uh, again a number of factors. Uh, genetics. There, we, we, the, there's there's some work that's been done at the University of Guelph and uh, in, in, other, in other places, showing that there's there's a genetic component to the fatty acid profile of uh, of, of cows. Stage of lactation, production level, of season, and parity are, are 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 also factors that that are known to be affect affecting milk fatty acid profile. So, for example, on the genetic side, uh, because the de novo. Uh, fatty acids depend on on the metabolic machinery in the other to synthesize those fatty acids. There there is a higher uh, heritability to the ones that are pre compared to the preformed fatty acids that are uh, more uh, affected by the uh, by the environment. And palmitic acid itself is uh, about uh, intermediate. On in terms of stage of lactation, this is data from uh, from the uh, the DHI uh, tests that we're doing. Um, or, or from, from routine DHI testing. So as you would expect, because of the negative energy balance and, and uh, lipid mobilization in their lactation, uh, there's, there's a, high a higher proportion of preformed fatty acid in early, lact uh, early lactation and uh, less, less de novo. And uh, because of, the, again, the mixed origin of palmitic acid, uh, the, uh, the, the, the shape is sort of, uh, of inter intermediate. Uh, this, this is, uh, again, from DHI data by grouping by parity. Uh, heifers tend to have a less, uh, less uh, uh, capacity of their de novo synthesis, uh, fatty acid synthesis machinery so that they tend to have lower de novo and C16 uh, uh, proportion and more preformed fatty acid uh, in their milk as opposed to mature cows. Uh, season and, uh, and uh, Dave will present uh, Canadian data, but uh, it's also well known that, uh, in, in the, uh, regardless of the country, we can see some difference in the, in, in this case, this, again, C16 zero uh, content uh, in the UK, in, in, in Sweden, and in Poland, and the Netherlands. All of the uh, data shows that, uh, in, in general, uh, palmitic acid content is lower. Uh, in the summer uh, than in the winter, and uh, the example of uh, of Sweden there uh, that uh, there's also a, a, an effect of region. Those are taken from two different regions of the country, and uh, the the seasonal effect is there, but there's also a, a regional an effect of the different regions. Uh, Forage to concentrate ratio uh, is is another uh, factor, uh, an important factor. And uh, and if we go deeper, the type of concentrates, whether it's starch digestibility uh, or starch content, uh, and the fat content or lipid content of the the concentrate will have an impact. So, for example, just the 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 the, the, feed, the fact of feeding more concentrates will uh, decrease the uh, the proportion of C16 zero and increase the the proportion of uh, long chain uh, uh, 18 one and NT2 coming from the concentrates and depress uh, the the novel fatty acid synthesis. Uh, pasture also is well known because of the higher lipid content of fresh grass. Uh, and the, the higher content of, uh, of uh, omega-3, high content of omega-3 omega fatty acids in uh, fresh grass that also has a, an impact on, on the, the, the fatty acid profile. Uh, and, and finally, more specifically on the, the impact of uh, fat supplement, uh, we reviewed both types of uh, palm-derived fatty acids. The more traditional or, or uh, type, which is the megalactide calcium salts of uh, uh, palm fatty acid distillates. Uh, the impact, uh, and that's reviewed by Dos Santos Neto, uh, the, uh, the, the, the difference in the, the control versus the supplemented uh, cows is about one and a half percent more Palmitic, uh, palmitic acid or C16-0 per 100 grams of fatty acid in cows receiving uh, calcium salts of fatty acid. But if you take the fat, the 16-0 enriched fat supplements, uh, so a, a different type of product with uh, with uh, uh, 85 to sometimes 90% uh, palmitic acid, whereas the the mega lactide, the the the, the, the uh, uh, calcium salts typically have a 45% uh, 
proportion uh, proportion of uh, of uh, palmitic acid. So obviously the impact on the fatty acid profile is different, and the we've estimated and and, and uh, summarized the the various uh, published research on uh, with with results that for each one percent. Uh, content of the, the supplement in the ration. So let's say a cow eating 25 kilos of dry matter would, rec would be receiving uh, 250 grams of, uh, of the feed supplement. You would see an increase of 8.1%, relative increase of 8.1% in, the, uh, con in the, 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 the proportion of C1601 in the milk. And that's a summary of uh, all of the published research with, uh, with, with these types of supplements. Uh, my last slide for now is uh, the, the, just a report of the uh, analysis of the, the retail butter that we did. So we collected in, in the spring uh, 40 samples from uh, various areas of the country, uh, Alberta, uh, Ontario, Quebec, and, and Atlantic. And uh, this is what uh, what we reported. Actually, the, the sorry, the, the slide on the right is what is some of the data that we're reporting and, and it's confirming what uh, what was suspected and long known that uh, 16-0 content has an impact as other many other fatty acids uh, a, a relationship with uh, hardness and solid fat content at 20 uh, at 20 degrees uh, and uh, the more the the more uh, c16-0 there is in milk the more the proport the, the higher the proportion of solid uh, fat uh, is in, in butter. Uh, to put in perspective, though, we also uh, added the, and that, that's from a different study, that's a, from a, a published study, uh, the relative importance of the change that we're seeing. So we're seeing the solid fat content at 20 degrees changing from, let's say, 39 to about 43. So that's a 4% uh, increase in uh, solid fat content at 20 degrees uh, is the effect of temperature. So uh, this this is a curve from a, a different data set, and and we don't have necessarily necessarily a lot of uh, other information. But the change in the percent of solid fat content as a function of temperature, uh, and the, the blue band here is our our addition. Uh, so between uh, a house that's at 20 degrees or 25 degrees of ambient temperature. Uh, there is a 4% difference in solid fat content. So the range of difference that we expect to see in the butter texture and, and, and solid fat content due to fatty acid uh, profile, or, uh, or more specifically in this case, the C16-0, is, is about the same range as you would see in the normal variation in uh, 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 ambient temperature in, in your house. Um, maybe actually one last slide that I also wanted to, to, to bring up is that there's been a lot of uh, uh, misunderstanding or, or, or a lack of clarity in, in terms related to the units in which fatty acid profile is, uh, is recommended because a lot of people were referring to the public, the, the, the observation that, that we had in terms of, uh, that we found in terms of uh, fatty acid profile in, or palmitic acid content of milk. Uh, our results from you saw from uh, from about 32 to 39 uh, to a much lower value in the uh, Canadian nutrition uh, file or nutrient file that is published. Uh, first of all, we had to understand what was the where was the data coming from, but also how it's reported. So uh, we've chosen to report the profile as uh, a proportion of all the fatty acids, so grams of uh, fatty acid X, or in this case, 16-0 uh, per 100 grams of fatty acid. So it's a true reflection of the profile uh, or the proportion of the fatty acid in the product, as opposed to sometimes being reported uh, per gram of product. So you introduce the fat content, but also the fatty acid content uh, of that fat. So that, that's important to, uh, to put the results in perspective. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop here and let uh, uh, Dave uh, continue with uh, some of the other parts of the, of the report. Great. Thank you very much, Danielle. And, and thank you, Stephen, for, uh, for the invitation. I'll just get my slides loaded up here. Um, so hopefully, can you just confirm that you can see my... You're good, Dave. That's fine. Thanks, Stephen. 
So again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to see so many people in, in the audience here today. Um, and it was certainly a pleasure um, working with the group that Danielle described. Um, it was quite, a, uh, quite an exercise that we undertook. Um, and I think all of us learned a few things in that process, which is nice as well. But before I sort of launch into describing some of our findings, I guess I, you know, in thinking about this, um, I hearken back to um, this past year, and I also had the opportunity through uh, my membership uh, in the International Dairy Federation, representing Canada there, um, to participate in the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and and that was quite a, quite an experience. It's an ongoing exercise. It's really looking at the challenges of feeding the entire world and bringing, um, you know, bringing appropriate food and, and supplying appropriate food to to the vast populations in in various parts of the world. And so I think when we, you know, when we look at things like butter hardness or non frothing milk, which is another area that I've sort of gotten into recently, I think we need to put that into perspective. These are first world problems, and and while um, we certainly do take them seriously, I think some some context sometimes is is worthwhile to think about. In terms of the report and the work that was done, um, and Danielle alluded to this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of these sections, but. Uh, one of the areas that we were certainly interested in looking at was the potential human health impact. Um, and this work was done by uh, Anthony Hanley and Richard Bazinet from the University of Toronto, both in the Department of Nutritional Sciences. And, and they basically summarized the literature, did quite an extensive search and, and to try to answer the questions, are there human health risks associated with changes in fatty acid composition of milk or milk products and, and their consumption? Um, I'll let you read the report. Uh, they provide a nice summary and some nice references there, but the bottom line was based on the existing literature that really the answer is no. Similar to um, the impacts on, on animal health, particularly cows, um, you know, we're talking about a, quite a safe product and, and the differences that we're seeing that Danielle described really don't translate into any, any significant change in health risk. Um, either either for people or, or, or for animals for that matter. What I will spend a little bit more time on, and, and Daniel introduced this in his earlier slides, was some work we were able to do in pulling together data from um, Canadian dairy farms and, and two data sets. Um, um, a lot of the work was actually done by Karen Hand. Many of you will know Karen. Karen's worked with, with me and, and been here at the University of Guelph uh, for a period of time as well. Um, and I want to acknowledge her contribution to this for sure. One of the things that, that came up in the conversations a year ago around Buttergate was, you know, is, is what we're seeing a function of the Canadian dairy system, supply management, and, and so forth. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to debate the merits of our supply managed system here today, but I think one of the things that we need to reflect on is that the data I'm going to describe to you in a large part is available to us because of the nature of our, our system, because we know where all dairy farms in the country are, and we actually have mechanisms in place where we can relatively easily access milk samples from every dairy farm in the country in very short order. And, and that allows us to do some of the things that I'll describe here shortly. So I think it's, uh, they're very, from based on my knowledge and, and my interactions with colleagues around the world, there are very few jurisdictions that could do what we were able to do. So I think we're, we're quite lucky in that regard. Um, through our, our provincial milk marketing boards, there is a sample of milk collected every time milk is collected from the dairy farm. Uh, this bulk tank sample ends up in, in a lab, either a provincial lab or, or uh, a lactonet lab somewhere in the country, and is tested routinely for composition, for payment purposes, for quality, and, and for health risks, so things like inhibitors and, and so forth. So that's part of our, our normal payment and, and regulatory system. Through these labs, though, um, and the technology that's available through those labs, we have some opportunities for some novel testing. 
um, particularly the equipment that is common across all of our labs has the ability to do mid infrared uh, testing and produce a spectral analysis of, of that bulk tank milk sample, which allows us to do things like look at the actual fatty acid composition and, and develop fatty acid profiles that, that are of interest from nutritional management of dairy cows, as Danielle alluded to, and also looking at things like free, free fatty acids that, that are um, significant in, in some of the things like non-frothing milk, off flavors, and, and so forth. In terms of our national coverage, um, this map is from 2020. The 2021 has not yet been posted, but just sort of from an illustration perspective, we've got um, over 10,000 dairy farms across the country. And over the period of time since about 2019, there have been a couple of projects that uh, we were able to leverage here in, in pulling these data sets together. There's been a project on running, uh, ongoing um, in the province of Quebec, led by Deborah Sanchi from, from Lactinet, looking at providing dairy producers and their nutritionists with um, fatty acid profile data for the dairy herd and, and how that might help them in formulating and, and monitoring feeding uh, programs on, on dairy farms. And then here we've been running a, a project um, with the support of Dairy Farmers of Ontario, actually looking at free fatty acid levels in, in milk on dairy farms um, as related to um, issues of, of non-frothing and, and so on. And, and so we've got some data from Ontario and also some from BC as well. So through those two projects, we're actually able to leverage quite a large data set that I'll show you here in a moment, representing over 80% of dairy farms in the country and over 70% of, of the dairy cows. We have a second data set that I'll describe as well that actually covers an even broader uh, swath of, of the country. So this is this first data set that we, pulled to, we were able to pull together. Um, this represents all dairy farms in Ontario and Quebec. So it's not a, a sample or sort of a, a subsample. It is actually a census. Um, and what we've got are data from every pickup on every dairy farm from, in this case, October of 2019 to May of, of 2021. So about 18 months worth of data. So they're over 1.8 million observations in this data set. So it's, it's a very rich data set. What Karen did then was, was summarize this. Um, in this case, what you're looking at here is the C16 or palmitic acid um, data where, where she generated a monthly average for a particular herd. And then we looked at that relative to how that was distributed um, within, within the population. And so you see that here. The dotted line is is the um, is is the average, um, and then you see the darker shaded area is the interquartile range, and then the lighter shaded area are sort of the extent of the fifth and ninety fifth percentile of those herd averages in a particular month. So it just gives you orients you a little bit. Uh, the vertical bars there are in January twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. So contained within that is a twelve month period. And so it's, it's interesting in looking at this, what one might speculate is that there was a, perhaps a small increase in C16 content over those 18 months. Again, recognizing all of the day-to-day the, the -day variation and the, the between herd variation. Um, but if one was to fit a line to that, you might see a slight positive slope. Danielle mentioned that in other jurisdictions, um, there's certainly evidence of a seasonal effect. Here again, if you look at the warmer months of the year, slightly lower, perhaps C16 values than in the colder months. But again, I'm not as convinced of that seasonal effect here. Um, and until we look at, have the opportunity to look at more years of data, I'll, I'll reserve judgment there perhaps. Um, to me, what jumps out here is the large between farm variation. So, and, and I think that speaks to um, what Danielle um, 
presented in, in his part of the presentation, all of the things that go into the fatty acid profile of milk on a particular farm, both nutritional and non-nutritional factors that, that really we see a lot of variation amongst farms and probably a lot more among farms than we do um, over time or um, by season, at least in this, in this data set. The other thing we were able to do is compile a second data set that Danielle referred to to get information from more provinces. So we we're able to get um, those samples from a shorter period of time, May to July of, of 2021. So this represents almost 200,000 samples from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta, and BC. And we did this to try to get a sense of where there's some regional differences. And again, this is the C16 or palmitic acid um, information here in front of you. Um, what we generally see are slightly higher levels in Alberta um, and, and perhaps BC, so in, in Western Canada. Um, and based on some of the conversations and anecdotal conversations with um, some dairy nutritionists and, and so on. That's perhaps not surprising as, as the inclusion of, of um, palm-based supplements and, and fat supplements in general are perhaps slightly a bit higher in the West than, than what we typically see here in Ontario and Quebec. But again, um, we don't have complete data to be, to be able to support that assertion. Um, again, these samples were taken in, in summer of 2021, the slightly higher average in, in uh, parts of the West. But again, you can see from the box and whisker plot that there is certainly a great extent of, of, of between farm variation um, that I alluded to earlier with the previous data set. Um, similar patterns in terms of some of the others, and I'm not going to go through all of the um, the individual fatty acids. In this case, this is C18-1 or oleic acid. Um, but it was interesting to look at these data on the left-hand side. You see there's a fair bit more variability early on. One of the things that we had to make sure that we did as we pulled these data together and as these projects started up that yielded these data is, is make sure that our calibrations were in line. And, and so it's not just a matter of switching the equipment on and getting these values there. We need to make sure that they're calibrated properly and so on. So that I think is, is part of what you're seeing there. The other part of it though, may be that, that we do see some year to year differences in, in some of the fatty co acid composition of milk, likely due to differences in, in feeds, forage quality, inclusion rates of various other feed components. So it's a complex issue and, and one that um, can be a bit challenging, I think, to, to sort out um, in, in terms of having all of the data readily available. Again, um, this, this is again for the C18-1, the distribution by, by, the, uh, by the regions. Our conclusions from looking at these data was that there are really small changes in overall fatty acid composition over that 18 month period. Certainly seemed to be some reach, small regional differences across Canada, perhaps in some cases, some evidence that there may be a seasonal effect. But again, we'd like to look at that over a longer period of time before we, we jump to that conclusion. But certainly the largest variation is among dairy farms. Um, one of the things that we spent a bit of time talking about is that, again, we were lucky to have these data available to us. Um, and, and I think what we need to look at as an industry are opportunities to not only do this testing in, in terms of some of the research um, opportunities that, that we have, but also make sure that we store these data over time so that when questions arise, such as this particular question that, that stemmed out of questions about hardness of butter, we have the data and we can go back and, and look at that. It would also be useful to have those data annotated with farm details. So things like to be able to tie it to even, even some fundamental management practices, um, some, some nutritional information about um, you know, in, inclusions of fat supplements, those kinds of things. So not a small undertaking, but it, this sort of exercise, I think, speaks to the potential value of doing that. 
you know, as as uh, as an example, and Ken Leslie's on the um, on the webinar here today. But it, I think it was through his prompting that we sort of started to look and track things like bulk tank somatic cell count back when when uh, I started my career here at OVC back in '88. And you know, we've been able to pull together data on a monthly basis over quite an extensive period of time, and sort of use that to track and understand a little bit better what's going on in terms of overall milk quality. And so I think there are opportunities here for us to, to broaden that exercise in, in some of these other things that we're testing now, able to test for now. Um, just a few brief comments about some of the other sections of the report. Uh, in chapter five, we looked at process related factors that drive butter hardness. This was um, led by Pouliot from uh, Laval University. Um, and, and in this chapter, and if, if you wanna have a look at it, um, interesting conversation and, and discussion and a really nice presentation of butter firmness or hardness or spreadability and how it's influenced by so many factors, including the milk composition to begin with, but then the actual process of, of manufacturing butter and number of the steps involved in that, and then the ultimate butter composition at the end and things like uh, storage of, of the butter um, time of milk and butter storage and, and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of potential sources of variability. Certainly some of those are, are better controlled than others, but we also know that butter, because of its nature, is, is a, a product that can be stored for periods of time. Um, and, and there are periods where we've had overproduction and then other times we've, we've been able to introduce that back into the market. And, and so um, it's, it is a way to, um, it, it is a product that can be stored for some longer periods of time. Again, I think as was pointed out, we really, we were able to look at the, some of the characteristics of the butter currently available across Canada and Danielle presented that. We certainly, there's no historic data uh, in terms of testing of butter over a longer period of time, like we had for milk. And so that sort of limited our ability to really comment in any way on whether there had been changes over time. So that was a, certainly a, a limitation in, in what's available to us. The final section I wanna comment on is chapter eight. And, and this is where we looked at sort of the broader issues around palm oil production and feeding of, of palm-based supplements to to cows and sort of use in general. And this was led by Jean-Francois Menard. And I mean, it's, and, and, and again, I won't do it justice here, but it, it raises a lot of complex ethical issues. Um, I think the use of, of palm oil overall is, is under debate globally um, due to some of the negative impacts on biodiversity and global temperatures resulting from um, deforestation and so on in, in some parts of the world. Um, it's also a, a fact that it's used in a large proportion of, of food items in our grocery stores, some estimates in Canada here up to 40% or more. Um, there certainly are efforts being made globally um, to make um, palm production more sustainable. Um, there is the round table on sustainable palm oil and to a large part, I think most of the um, palm-based um, supplements that, that we use in the dairy industry, um, I think are, are sourced, or at least there's some evidence that they're, they are sourced from these RSPO member companies. Um, Danielle also alluded to the fact that on Canadian dairy farms, the use of, of fat supplements, especially palm-based fat supplements is quite variable by farm, by region and, and over time. Um, and, and so there's some issues there that I think need to be addressed, but are, go well beyond their use in, in, uh, in, in the production of, of dairy products. Um, we also looked at what was available in literature in terms of the carbon footprint of, of um, palm production in terms of, of dairy products. Um, and really they hadn't been explicitly included um, in any of the life, life cycle analyses that we were able to access. Um, currently, the International Dairy Federation is updating its, its um, uh, life cycle analysis methodologies and, and those haven't been released yet. And, and so I cannot tell you whether um, 
palm production and palm products are a component of that or not, but might be worth looking at as we move forward. Um, based on our committee, our sort of conclusions from this were that palm derived supplements used by in the Canadian in, in milk production in Canada, certainly not all farmers use them, but they are made from palm oil byproducts by and large. And so don't aren't necessarily primary drivers of, of palm production. Um, and we certainly recommend um, efforts to improve sustainability and sourcing from RSPO certified products where possible. Um, and with that, I think I'll, I'll stop here, turn it back over to Danielle, who will uh, share with you some of the, the, um, our conclusions from, uh, in, in terms of the report. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, so so uh, I think Dave mentioned one of the, the conclusion that, that that we came to is that to, to the specific question about whether or not there had been changes in one butter consistency and two a link of these potential alleged changes uh, to the use of palm oil. Uh, the answer is that we don't have the data to either confirm it or or or, or disprove it, uh, and and that that is. Uh, 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 related to the fact that there, there is very little uh, historic uh, perspective on the fatty acid profile. Uh, they've, they've shown that we have about, uh, we have less than two years worth of historical data in terms of, of uh, time series, in terms of evolution of the fatty acid profile of raw milk. And we have no uh, historical data on the butter consistency. So uh, we, we don't have any idea of what was the butter consistency or butter hardness uh, 10, five years, 10 years or 15 years ago. So, so those, those, are, those are additional conclusions in addition to the, the fact that, or highlighting that uh, we, we do recognize that there's a connection or there's, there's an impact of using palm derived fatty, uh, palm derived products on fatty acid composition. And there's a link between fatty acid composition on uh, on butter consistency, but one the the the, the impact or the, the the effect of the change to, on the changes of fatty acid profile due to uh, the use of those supplements is a small, relatively small proportion of all the other factors that are influencing milk fatty acid profile, uh, and that in addition to changes in fatty acid profile, not only of C160, but all of the other fatty acids have a, a role or an impact on butter consistency. And there are other factors in addition to milk composition that are affecting uh, butter consistency. Uh, so uh, just to conclude with the uh, with uh, some of the recommendations that we uh, that we provided to the industry. Um, the first one, uh, Dave alluded to it is that uh, we we think there there would be value to the industry to have uh, more uh, consistent and continuous uh, monitoring of both the fatty acid profile as the data that 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 uh, Dave mentioned. Uh, we only had the historical data for for only for for two provinces, so it would be useful to have that extended across the country and done a consistency across Canada, consistently across Canada, but also on the butter characteristics. So we we in this case all the data, the only data that we had was the the, the data that we uh, gathered ourselves by buying the butter samples uh, and, and testing them. Uh, more broadly, I think uh, it'd be valuable for the industry to uh, make sure that when we do research or development uh, or, or research application uh, of uh, different production practices or processing uh, uh, procedure, uh, to consider not only the impact on uh, whether it's production or milk composition, but also try to understand if there would be impacts on the final product characteristics, whether it's uh, on from uh, from feeding changes, etc. So uh, that that's something that we should keep in mind when we're uh, developing research projects to uh, to think through all the way down the the, the chain. Uh, I, I sort of mentioned that when we talked about uh, butter hardness, uh, we we have very uh, precise methods of measuring the physical uh, characteristics of butter, but 
there's not a lot of uh, we, uh, knowledge, knowledge or understanding of how uh, how much of these differences, what's the, the threshold of uh, perception of these differences uh, that we can measure by the consumer, uh, and how um, do they compare relative to, to, to other uh, changes? Uh, and and re uh, still related to consumers uh, having uh, feedback or, or a way to connect and, and, and understand the concerns and the preferences and, and mostly to build trust and confidence in, in the products to make sure that, we, we, uh, that, that the industry uh, uh, maintains good contacts and, and uh, understanding of con consumer uh, per perceptions. Uh, speaking to that, we try to get from uh, manufacturers uh, any data on, on uh, customer satisfaction or customer complaints and uh, the, the number of complaints related to butter consistency across, was not different across years and was very, very small and almost anecdotal in terms of, of numbers. Uh, considering the millions of consumers, uh, there was a handful of uh, a formal complaint. So that, that's clearly not the, only, the, the, the best way to, to collect uh, uh, consumer uh, perceptions. Uh, uh, Dave also alluded to the uh, RSPO and the, the sustainable certification of palm products. Although we our understanding is that most of the companies that are supplying those products are member of the uh, round table for sustainable palm, uh, palm oil. Uh, their products, uh, the products used in, in, uh, as feed supplements are not uh, specifically um, certified as RSPO. So I think the, we, we need to encourage uh, this uh, certification to really have, again, uh, a way to build trust in, in, the, in the final products. And uh, also alluded to by Dave is the, in the next uh, life cycle analysis, uh, it would be important to uh, have a better idea, a, a better representation of the actual feeding practices on the farm, including lipid supplements, which were, uh, as, as Dave said, not included in the analysis. Uh, and, and also, uh, it would be interesting to have a scenario analysis of what if we remove this, or what if uh, the palm oil that is used was removed, was replaced by another source, what also would be the impact, understanding that one of the uh, other than the the the, the, uh, the desirable nutritional characteristics of, of palm fatty acids uh, is is also the the yield of uh, of palm uh, the, of oil by by the palm uh, plant. Uh, so, getting the same amount of oil uh, to feed to, to cows or for any other application uh, would likely require a large a much larger acreage. To be uh, to, to grow the same amount of oil uh, from from other sources, so that also has an environmental uh, environmental impact. So uh, those are the, were the the recommendations made to the uh, to to the industry, and uh, I know that uh, dairy farmers of Canada accepted and, and acknowledged those recommendations, and and uh, their commitment is to uh, at least devote. Uh, more resources and, and, and interest and, and prioritize research to, uh, to, to fill those gaps uh, in the future. So with that, I uh, thank you and uh, I'd be happy to uh, uh, answer questions. And as Dave said, uh, just a, on a personal note, th this was a very uh, professionally uh, enriching uh, uh, experience having uh, those types of discussion at, at a very broad uh, level of the industry with, with uh, a diverse range of, uh, of experts from, uh, from uh, the whole spectrum of the industry from uh, feeding the cow to uh, uh, the, the, the human nutrition and, and many impacts uh, or uh, aspects in between. And then uh, it was also a very pleasant uh, group to work with, very engaged and, and generous of their time and expertise to the, to the process. So that was a, uh, that, I was very uh, appreciative and uh, felt very fortunate to be part of this group. So thanks everyone, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much, Danielle. Thank you, Dave. Uh, really appreciate well your time today and, and uh, generosity of spirit in presenting for this group, but uh, but also for the obvious amount of work that uh, you and your colleagues on the expert working group put put into this. Uh, so with that, I'll open up the floor for questions. You can use the chat or uh, just put up your virtual hand and uh, you can ask your question in the traditional way. 
Um, I, I guess maybe just to kick things off, I'll ask either of you to, to comment. Um, you both alluded to it in, in the conclusions in terms of ongoing monitoring or perhaps this question of, you know, would it have been nice to have more historic data to go off of? Um, maybe just expand on that. I mean, in, you know, 2020 hindsight, but on the other hand, was, was that a, a reasonable thing. I mean, there's a hundred things we might monitor with with uh, either processes or or products. Um, yeah, just if if I could get you to expand on that at all. I mean, was this uh, would there be any reason to have done this other than the history that happened over the last year? Yeah, that's a good point. I'll I'll, I'll start uh, if you if you don't mind. Uh, that, that's a good point. The the only reason, for example, the, the uh, uh, Dave can comment on on what drove Ontario to be doing this testing. But the reason we were, we started doing this testing in the, for, for Quebec was, uh, and, and in this case, I'm changing, I'm putting my, my Lectinet hats, uh, and uh, that was for developing a product that was of value to producers uh, as a management tool, has nothing to do with, had nothing to do uh, for, for, uh, with any desire to to do a monitoring at an industry level, it was just because we saw an interest, a commercial and an industry interest for for industry good to 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 generate this data and and actually make it a, a, a commercial products for us. We we uh, all we did is ask permission to the marketing board to use these samples to gen generate the data, but that was not the result of a of a, a an industry monitoring initiative. And I think that that that's that's the intent of this recommendation is for the industry to think about what are the opportunities that uh, we could have to have a better understanding of, of some of the factors that we could monitor uh, more readily. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll just pick up on that. Uh, in Ontario, again, the data that we had available um, was through the good graces of dairy farmers of Ontario, and it was because there was an interest and and they had asked us to look at the free fatty acid um, issue in, in particular. And as part of that free fatty acid testing, the fatty acid profile was available. I guess a couple of comments and, and um, I mean, none, none of this happens on a routine basis unless A, somebody initiates it and B, somebody pays for it. I mean, there are costs associated with these kinds of exercises. But having said that, um, there are things like, I alluded to the equipment that's being used, so, so we have the ability to generate spectral analysis and, and profiles of, of milk samples, and then, you know, there are algorithms then to derive from that things like the fatty acid composition. I think as an industry, uh, it, it's worthwhile for us, I think, to think about should we be storing these, and these spectral these, these full spectrum analysis for every sample or a subset of samples from this point onward in perpetuity. I mean, we run into issues around storage capacity, but that's a lot cheaper than it was 10 years ago and so on. Um, you know, I think it, it's something that I, um, I hope that as a result of, of the work that we've done in this working group, at least it comes back as a point of discussion for the industry to at least think about what might be useful to do, what could we, what could be done um, that might allow us to more quickly, more easily respond to these types of questions and queries in, in the future. The other aspect to this is sort of the annotation part. Um, in other words, what do we know about the farms and farm management practices? You know, I look at Canada and, and again, Danielle knows the numbers even better than I do, but I'm, as a country, we're somewhere between 70 and 75% of our herds enrolled in milk recording. So we do have a wealth of information that's available that, that could be tied to this. And, and so for certain questions that we might have, there, there would be opportunities in the future. But I think rather than waiting sort of and, and letting things evolve, I think this is a discussion maybe we need to have as an industry thinking proactively about what we might do, what we should do, um, and then figure out, of course, you know, what the cost might be and how we support that. Great, thanks. Thank you both. Um, one question from the chat, uh, if, if you're able to comment on it. Um, was there 
I'm paraphrasing, was there consideration in, in making your recommendations that ProAction uh, might recognize other quality assurance schemes for ingredients? Um, so you mentioned the RSPO, uh, but there are others. Was that something that came up and any further thoughts on that? Uh, Dave, Dave, you talked about the, about that that part. You want to jump in? Yeah, and, and so I think based on our mandate, our, our mandate was to report to DFC, um, and and I guess we didn't consider it within our mandate to then tell them how this should be incorporated into assurance programs like like ProAction. It certainly, I think it that's something that that could happen, um, but that wasn't necessarily our mandate to be that specific and sure. way, Danielle, you want to comment on that as well. uh, and, and i think as as it's mentioned in the question uh today uh, to, to our knowledge very lit the, the, uh, I'm not convinced that uh, we we're not aware that there's there's a lot if any of the products that are actually certified so uh we would need to encourage uh, manufacturers to get certification, especially understanding that they're members of the uh, the uh, the round table. But uh, we, we we would it would be uh, premature, I think, to to request that because of because pr pr products wouldn't be available to to uh, to meet that requirement. Yep. Thanks for that. Uh, Doug Goff has a virtual hand up. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the presentation, guys. Um, I was just wondering if 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 there is data available to indicate that there has been an increase in use of palmitate or palm oil products over, say, a ten year period of time, or you know, has is there increasing use, or has there been increasing use of palm oil products in in dairy cattle feeding? So, so we 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 obviously asked that question to Anac, and and they weren't able to come up with this this uh, this uh, this data. Uh, just just getting it from one year was was a bit of a of an undertaking. Uh, what we can suspect, because because the calcium salt products have been around for uh, decades. I think eight, eight, early 80s was when they, they were first approved for use as, a, as an energy supplement. So they've been around for, for a very long time. The uh, palmitic acid enriched products have, are more recent, probably I would say 15 years at the, the most. So there might have been a shift from the calcium salts to the, uh, the palm, palmitic acid enriched products. Uh, over time, uh, more than or, or in addition, or more than the uh, than an, an overall increase in, in the usage. But but we have absolutely no data to to uh, yeah. to, to confirm that. Okay. Good. Thank you, Doug. All right, I will do one last call for any questions. Uh, there's one just there, appearing there, in the chat there, the, the rationale no. uh, in, for, for feeding palm oil, which is obviously expensive. So yeah, maybe sort of back to the basics of why would we, why would one do this in the first place? Yeah. So, so one, uh, I was talking about the shift from, from uh, calcium salts to palm, palmitic uh, acid enriched products. And one of the reasons for that is that there, the, 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 the Higher palmitic acid content ch uh, changes or shifts the use of the the, the, the fatty acids in the product towards more uh, usage by the mammary gland to incorporate it into fat into uh, in, into milk fat. So that it does, uh, in general, increase uh, milk fat content. Uh, but but uh, you're very right to point out the economics. So uh, as a, and now again, I'm going to put on my my uh, lactonet hat. But we've been doing a lot of education seminars on uh, looking at uh, alternatives because very often it's not the most economic way to max it to optimize uh, milk fat, and very often it's more of a uh, not a band aid but something that's fixing uh, another deficiency that could be uh, from from the, the the lack of fiber or the physical form of the fiber or the uh, the, the forage quality or, or feeding management. So uh, this will always be the more economical way to optimize milk fat 
production. And, and again, we emphasize the, uh, the, the importance of, of looking at the margin over feed costs of the various scenarios, especially uh, with the recent increase in the last year, uh, price, the price of those products has, has uh, gone through the roof and, and uh, the economic justification is, is a lot harder. The, the response you need to justify the use in the, in the ration uh, in, in terms of uh, butter fat is, is, uh, is uh, even bigger. Good, thank you. Uh, we've got a comment there, but I think so. We'll, one really last call for any final questions. And if not, uh, I'll just put in a, a shameless plug, not, not for myself, but for our Dairy at Group, uh, Dairy Guelph uh, Group and Network, that uh, picking up on something uh, that was mentioned by the in the report and by Dave, I think today that, um, you, you know, perhaps this is a case where there could be unintended consequences of a nutritionally based uh, tactic with a consideration of economics, but that at least potentially could have effects on a finished product that was was never intended. And, and so, yeah, thinking about those research projects uh, where we have the capacity to say, make a dietary manipulation in the cow, consider effects on productivity, health, fertility, et cetera, but also finish product. And, and you're right, somebody has to have the interest and, and has to pay for it. And, and that's probably often what's missing. But, but if there's a, a positive here, perhaps it's uh, an encouragement to all of us doing research to, to at least think about that and look for those collaborations that uh, put more links in that chain as, as we're doing uh, uh, animal experiments. With that, thank you to everyone for attending today. Thanks again to Dave and Danielle for, uh, for your time and for all the work that went into the report. Uh, it's, it's an excellent resource for the industry, lots of food for thought, and we really appreciate your time today. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Bye.